Hello, this is Crystal Stanich, and thank you for joining me for this week's First Chapter Friday. Today, I will be kicking off a new series on Jennifer Chevrini books. Uh, Jennifer Chevrini is going to be our Henry County Author Talk coming up May 6th at the Art Association of Henry County. Uh, please get registered for that event at the library calendar at nchcpl.librarycalendar.com. Space is limited in the gallery, so please get signed up. The first 100 attendees will receive a free copy of her newest book. Chapter one, Mrs. Lincoln's Dressmaker. November 1860 through January 1861. On election day, Elizabeth Keckley hurried home from a mid-afternoon dress fitting to the red brick burning house on 12th Street, where she rented two small rooms in the back. Although she never failed to carry her license, attesting to her status as a freed woman whenever she ventured out, on that day of the presidential election of 1860, she was eager to be safely indoors well before curfew. The city hummed with breathless excitement, even though the white citizens of Washington City, District of Columbia, were not enfranchised to vote. In this, the capital's colored residents, both slave and free, were their equals. Although Elizabeth prudently refrained from remarking upon this similarity to the wives of the city's social and political elite, for whom she sewed the beautiful gowns they wore to balls and levees and receptions. Her patrons were united in their suspicion of and disdain for the Republican candidate. A lawyer from Illinois they disparaged as an unpolished rube from the West and a radical abolitionist. They disagreed, however, on which of his three rivals ought to succeed President Buchanan, who, if ineffectual, had at least done their home states and the South's peculiar institution no enduring harm. If a spontaneous parade sprang up and turned into a riot, as happened far too often those days, Elizabeth wanted to be well away from the fur. Already, the streets were filling with men hurrying from tavern to hotel for the news of the election, gathering on corners with like-minded fellows and glaring across the way at their rivals, crowding anxiously around the doors of the telegraph office on 14th Street, although the returns wouldn't be in for hours yet. Many folks had obviously been enjoying the free whiskey dispensed by the various political clubs that dotted the blocks near the White House. And from time to time, their bursts of raucous laughter drown out even the unceasing clip-clop of horses' hooves and the more distant whistles of passing trains. As she made her way home, Elizabeth tightened her grip on her sewing basket and kept her bearing serene and composed, flinching only once when a young man wearing a campaign button boasting a tintype of Mr. Breckenbridge, Breckenbridge, Brick in Ridge jostled her in his haste to reach the bulletin board outside the National Hotel. She breathed a sigh of relief when she reached her own quiet neighborhood, a haven in what had been unfamiliar city, only months before. She had come to Washington City that spring after a few failed weeks in Baltimore, where her struggle to find work convinced her to seek her fortune elsewhere. Not long before that, she had lived in St. Louis, where, after years of toiling and saving, she had purchased her freedom and her sons. Now, George was a student at Wilberforce University in Ohio, and she was a successful Mantua maker, a businesswoman with an admirable reputation, independent and free. She could more easily bear the miles separating her from her only child, knowing that he was acquiring the education she herself had always longed for and had been denied and that no man could claim him as property ever again. Virginia Lewis, her landlady and dear friend, must have seen her approach through the front window, for she met her at the door. What's the news? she asked, breathless, studying her expression as if to read the answer there. I know how your ladies talk. If anyone knows what's happening, they would. I'm afraid they don't know any more than we do. 
Elizabeth set down her sewing basket and unwrapped herself from her shawl. Nothing's changed from what we heard this morning. Mr. Lincoln's favorite to win, but we won't know for a fact until they count the ballots. I suppose your ladies wouldn't care much for a President Lincoln. Not one bit. Most of their husbands like Mr. Breckenridge. Breckenridge. And so they too, likewise. A few of them like Mr. Bell, too. Elizabeth lowered her voice conspiratorially. As for Mr. Lincoln, they fear he wants to free all the slaves. And if you would like to know what happens next, you can check this title out on the Libby app. Please join me here next week as I read from the beginning of Jennifer Chavarini's Resistance Woman. Thank you and have a great week.